All right, the results are in. Uh, we are not officially, but pretty certainly now in a recession. Uh, if not, soon to be a full-blown Great Depression 2.0. And no, you can't blame this on lockdowns. You can't blame this even on Vladimir Putin. This is 100% self-imposed by Washington on the American people. Of course, you know, recessions are always inevitable when you are, uh, when you live in a Fed-fueled bubble economy. Inevitably, when the Fed decides to hike rates, either because they just feel like it or because inflation is getting out of control, like in our case, that's going to pop the bubble. But it usually doesn't pop the bubble after one quarter percent rate hike, 25 basis points. That's all the Fed was able to hike before pushing American GDP into the negative territory. And no, you, you can't blame this on Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin's not doing it. You, I mean, you can largely, I guess you can largely blame it on the Biden administration because this wouldn't be nearly as bad um, if they were not disrupting energy markets, if they were not both uh, anti-domestic uh, American oil, anti-domestic energy, anti-fossil fuels in general, uh, as well as being anti-importing uh, fossil fuels. Uh, it is obvious that when their policies drive up energy prices in the United States. You know, there's a direct input-output relationship between energy and GDP. If energy gets more expensive, energy becomes more scarce, less can be produced in the economy. It's that simple. And when we produce less, we have less GDP. It's a pretty basic, I mean, you don't have to go through the arithmetic. It's a logical equation. It's not an arithmetic equation, although some people have broken down. It, it kind of is an arithmetic equation. I mean, it is, it is that direct of a relationship, um, you know, but when you look, I mean, even just oil, leaving out other forms of energy, oil consumption, there's a pretty darn direct arithmetic relationship uh, between oil consumption and U.S. GDP. But we've had oil price spikes in the past. Oil has gotten expensive and it didn't immediately push us into a recession. And the explanation for that, I would say, is that, as I've been saying since I started this channel, the American economy, year after year, is getting fundamentally weaker. It is becoming more and more fragile and more and more dependent on either federal government stimulus, on Federal Reserve job owning, on um, Federal Reserve financial engineering to prop up our fake economy. And as soon as any of those things start to falter, uh, the house of cards will start to collapse. And that's what we're witnessing. We've been witnessing it for a couple months now. Uh, you know, the stock market is always the canary in the coal mine. It is uh, a forward indicator in that sense of when the bubble, when the air is coming out of the bubble. Stocks don't move in a straight line. So it's not saying that every day when you see a red stock market, that's an indication that, oh my gosh, we're going to go into a recession. But it's pretty clear when uh, when the stock market is moving down in the wrong direction as the Fed sees it, in, the, in a direction which is opposite that of you know the Fed's typical policy goal, which is to send stocks straight up. That means that um, if you know if stock markets are going in that direction, everything else probably will too, because the Fed has had a policy for decades now of making uh, GDP and asset prices, meaning stocks, bonds, real estate, all move in one direction and that's up. And so when you see any, since all of those uh, prices and GDP really is at the end of the day is a price, the GDP is a very simple, stupid, somewhat meaningless equation, which is just the sum of all prices of all goods sold uh, in a given year. And so if you see any of those four things, stock prices, bond prices, real estate prices, or GDP going down, you can typically expect for the other four things to start to decline as well at some point. Those, those four things move pretty much in the same direction, or at least they tend to move in the same direction because they are all so heavily influenced uh, and controlled. Either uh, 
implicitly or explicitly, directly or indirectly, by Fed policy. Even if you think that the folks at the Fed are essentially like the Wizard of Oz and that they don't have any real power, people just think that they're powerful and that and therefore they, they control markets by managing you know, expectations policy. Nonetheless, the result is the same. The Fed is still in control. And what we're witnessing in Q1 and in uh, not only in GDP and in the stock market is that without the Fed, absence um, extreme Fed interference to the upside, markets want to move to the downside. There is no fundamental strength in the U.S. economy, in the U.S. stock market. Um, and I would argue, uh, well, certainly the bond market's been getting hit a lot too. You know, particularly the higher risk stuff, um, the stuff that is not so much, you know, where you're going to see a flight to safety. Real estate is going to start moving in that direction as well. And so this Q1 GDP print is just sort of a confirmation of all that. And I have to say, I'm surprised at the rate at which we are uh, descending into a recession. I just looked at what the Fed's done in the past, and I, and I figured, hey, it looks like every time that the Fed starts a tightening cycle, they're able to tighten about half of what they were, of you know, to where they tightened in the previous tightening cycle. And so, since you know, in, in 08, they got around five percent. In uh, 18, 19, they got up to like two and a quarter percent. Um, this time. I figured, oh, well, they'll probably get up to like 1%. Nope, they got up to one quarter percent. Now, that doesn't mean that this is the end of the tightening cycle. We don't know that yet. It's not certain uh, that the Fed is going to cut rates from here. Of course, they can only cut 20 by 25 basis points unless the Fed um, decides to uh, pursue a policy of negative nominal interest rates, which would be, I think, a rapid departure. Uh, from where the Fed has stood in the past, Powell himself has been some, a vocal opponent of negative interest rate policy. He's obviously not that big of an opponent of uh, negative real interest rates. We've had negative real interest rates uh, for uh, pretty much the entirety of Jerome Powell's tenure at the Fed. But he's always drawn the line at negative nominal interest rates, meaning a negative Fed funds rate. So uh, I don't believe that, you know, as Zero Hedge somewhat tongue-in-cheek put it this morning, you know, <laughs> uh, 90 per, or so, I forget what they said. They said something ridiculous like 90% odds uh, that Powell cuts by 50 basis points, you know, to negative, uh, negative 0.25%. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that uh, the Fed very well might cut back down to zero, but that would make them look stupid. It would make them look ridiculous because they're supposed to be tightening uh, and, and hiking rates to fight inflation. Um, but so far, all they've managed to do is fight GDP. And, you know, to be honest, uh, it will be easier to uh, kill America's house of cards economy than it will be to kill inflation. I don't think it's impossible. I don't think it's necessarily as hard as you think, as I've said in the past. I don't think that the Fed actually has to raise the Fed funds rate above the rate of inflation, you know, the official rate of inflation, let alone the real rate of inflation, which is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15%. Um, I don't think that they have to raise rates that high because I don't think that the Fed is directly amplifying uh, the purchasing power of the average American. Um, we don't have, like, you know, Fed debit cards that are issued by Jerome Powell. The way that the Fed is, you know, inflating the dollar in the domestic economy is through uh, two main transmission mechanisms, as I see it. One is asset prices. That's obvious. The Fed inflates the price of assets. People then who own assets become wealthy, and they're able to... Um, you know, use that wealth, uh, they're able to leverage that wealth to fund their own consumption. And then the second method is government spending, massive government deficits. I think the Fed understands that the federal government is not going to cut their budget. 
And so they're not going to be able to turn off that spigot. That transmission mechanism is not, you know, they could, uh, sure, could the Fed nuke uh, the federal government's borrowing power? Yes, but they are not going to do that. They're not going to pick that fight. Uh, because probably if that happened, uh, Congress, um, now there would be a split in this, but I think that the, if the Fed really went after the federal government's ability to borrow, the Fed would be replaced with a even more overtly politically controlled central bank. But that's, you know, that's a ridiculous hypothetical. That's not something that's going to happen. I don't, I don't want to spend time speculating on that. What the Fed has to do to fight inflation is kill asset prices. In killing asset prices, people will feel poor. They will feel impoverished. They'll feel like, oh my gosh, I've lost my life savings or my 401k. I've lost, you know, all my equity in my house. I'm potentially underwater in my house. And they will spend less and they will save more. That's what you have to do to get inflation to stop. You have to get people to stop spending money. Stop saying, I want this, I want it now, and I would, uh, I will, I will happily pay you uh, double today for that which will cost me triple tomorrow. I've been talking about this for a while. It's something that everybody is feeling right now. If there's something that you want and you have the ability to get it, you're going to pay more than you, than you, you know, would during normal times just to get it now because you know it's going to cost more the next, if you try and go and buy it later. And stuff that you already have that you want, that you might not need, you're reluctant to sell because you know, hey, if I want, if I end up needing this or wanting this again in the future, I don't think I'll be able to afford it then. So I'm just going to hang on to it. And so people hoard goods, and they shun cash. The way that you end an inflation is by getting them to do the opposite. And of course, you know, you're the central bank. Stop printing money, but the Fed's not going to do that. So this is the best they can do. You know, the Fed is not going to stop printing money and giving it to the federal government. So at the very least, they can uh, stop printing money to, to prop up Wall Street and the housing market and allow people uh, the opportunity to save their money. And in the process, GDP must necessarily collapse. I hope that Jerome Powell is mentally prepared for this. I would, I, you know, I mean, the fact that they're fighting inflation at all, or claiming to, you know, in their head, they have to have thought about this a little bit. They had to know that this is what less consumption looks like. And frankly, we're, it's not like inflation's done yet. Inflation is still high. Consumption is still high. It's just, uh, it's just the consumption, the rate of the growth of consumption currently does not exceed the rate of inflation. That's why you have a negative real GDP. That's what we're looking at, negative real GDP growth. Because yes, GDP grew in nominal terms. People are spending more than ever right now. But the rate of inflation, even the official CPI, is higher than that rate of growth of nominal GDP. Uh, you know, if the Fed really wanted to kill inflation, we would have no nominal GDP growth. People would actually spend less. Now, do I think that we will get to that extreme of a point? I mean, perhaps, but at this point, it's not likely. We really have to see. I want to see what the next thing Powell says is. Now that it's confirmed, okay. The recession is pretty much begun. I mean, because the reason why I say, you know, it's not official until it's two quarters. That's what people say. Well, if the Fed continues down this path, it will be official. The only way for them to avoid it, and I don't think this is a good idea, would be to flip-flop now and try and do everything they can to move back the other direction. And that theoretically should bolster inflation, should keep inflation high, should keep it from going down. Um but they might be able to salvage some, you know, GDP. It certainly will be a boon to the stock market. That's why the stock market today is, I think NASDAQ was up somewhere around 3%, something absurd. All on rate cut optimism. They said, oh great, we're going into a recession. That means that Powell is not going to hike rates anymore and he's gonna cut rates, right guys? That's what you're seeing here. 
don't expect this rally to continue. And again, it's only been one day so far. <laughs> Stocks have been, um, you know, have fallen flat on their face for uh, many, many weeks, if not months. So if Powell comes out and essentially says that he's going to stay the course, this rally's dead. It will have never even happened. No one will remember, uh, you know, April tw the 28th, 2022, uh, as, you know, a d the day in which the stock market turned around. They'll remember it as uh, the day that uh, Americans first got, you know, an indication that, you know, hey, the recession has arrived. You know, and the trouble here is, you know, I'll talk about this more once we really get into it. If the Fed is serious, if they do bring us down into the, the situation, how do you go into recession and avoid all the defaults? How do you avoid the collapse of the zombie corporations? How do you avoid um, just all of the debt, the mortgages, all of it coming and unwinding? Because you can't let the debt unwind. If you let the debt unwind, that is the end of America. I talk about this a lot. I mean, I almost, I sound stupid to myself because I use the phrase so much, but I mean, that's what we're looking at. It's that serious. We're living in a debt-based country. And if that debt does not continually expand, let alone contract, we're done. There is no sustaining this. One day it will all come crashing down spectacularly. It's just a matter of, you know, how long we can stave that off. That's why recessions are so extremely dangerous. Remember back in 2008 when you know, the whole system almost collapsed? It really did. You know, that wasn't hyperbole. Um, this whole shell game would have been over and we would have had to go back to being a normal country with a normal economy where we consume what we produce. America hasn't been that really since the end of World War II. But we certainly haven't been that since the 1980s. I mean, 1980s, that was really the, the change. The, that was a, a par fundamental paradigm shift. So this is now going to be, as far as I'm concerned, the most important story um, that I will be following on a regular basis. Um, the collapse of the American economy, if it does lead to that. Or at least, you know, hey, this, this one might be, this might not be the big one. Maybe the Fed can kick the can down the road like they did in March of 2020. You know, in March 2020, things looked really bad. Oh my gosh, here's the recession. Things are going to start collapsing. And then the government came in with, you know, PPP loans and all these bailouts. And the Fed even announced, hey, look, we're going to do QE for corporate debt. But now the Fed's supposed to be going in the opposite direction. The Fed is supposed to be unwinding QE right now. Are they going to really flip-flop that bad? They're going to go back to even saying, you know what, why don't we do QE and buy corporate junk bonds? I don't know, it's hard to imagine right now, but, you know, give it a few weeks and the Fed might move in that direction. So with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.